interesting question. Yeah, so I'm going to try to restate your question and make sure I understand it. So you're asking, how do you think outside the box when your box is your who you who you sort of define yourself to be? And what's the second part of it? Um, and you know that you like you really can't change that. And so how can you expect to think like somebody else when you don't even know how someone else thinks? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that I, you know, I think there are some core things about who we are that form our identity that remain stable to some extent throughout your lifetime. But there are also things that can be influenced by outside experiences. And one of the reasons I like visual art is that it sometimes provides a very slight, you know, kind of opens the lid to the box. Maybe you don't get all the way out of the box, but you can at least peek outside of that box, see other perspectives. Um, the way that I think about teaching and curriculum has a lot to do with um, research and whether that's getting out and studying a thing like looking at a plant in the field or talking to a person or reading about an artist but really digging into other experiences and kind of digging into other ways of knowing and pushing yourself um, there's an educational philosopher named Lev Vygotsky he's long dead but Vygotsky t came up with this term called zone of proximal development that if you're a good educator what you do is you push people to achieve something that's just out of reach. And sometimes what's just out of reach is another way of knowing. And it's, it's about sort of pushing yourself outside of what narrowly defines you or broadly defines you in terms of identity. It's about kind of trying to walk a mile in another man's shoes or various other sort of phrases that we talk about. But ultimately, it's about trying to kind of gain other ways of knowing and maybe gain other experiences. I mean, one of the things about getting out into the community uh, as an artist is that you are physically in another place that's not necessarily your home base and that you are talking to people that you might not talk to otherwise. And that, particularly for community arts, um, I think is, it's crucial. And that, that can even be something as simple as going to a gallery and meeting a living artist, talking to another artist about why they do what they do. And it's a step in that direction to kind of build knowledge. you have a follow-up question? Do yeah. you have some of your artwork with you? I don't, no. I, I can show you my Instagram. I do a lot of, a lot of my work is, um, is interactive. So, and it's, it tends to be installation. So I like to build things that people have to get inside and do something with. So they're not really easy to carry around, um, but I can describe a couple examples to you that are recent works that I made. I made a blanket fort that you have to get on the floor and crawl into. Once you get inside there, there's a beanbag chair and a TV, and it's playing a movie of different people telling funny stories about me and my family. And all of our family members are telling funny stories. And the name of the artwork is called the Inside Joke Project. And some of the funny, some of the stories are funny even if you don't know us because some things are universally funny and some of the things don't make any sense and they're not funny and they're kind of uncomfortable. And I was really interested in this idea of number one, breaking down barriers of how we interact with art in a gallery and number two, kind of giving you the opportunity and the space to think about what, what funny is, like what does that mean? Sometimes funny is, is culturally specific, sometimes there's lots of, there's inside jokes where like you only have, you, like only a few people know. You might have like a catchphrase or a single word that is really funny because it means something specific to a certain experience. And so it's kind of trying to play around with that. So you have to crawl on the floor, which is funny kind of in a way. You have to crawl on the floor, get in there, and then you can watch it. And you never know which stories you're going to watch. The whole DVD is 55 minutes long. Nobody stayed the whole time that I know of. So, yeah. It's all packed up in my house. And another, I mean, I have another piece that's similar to that, um, and it's just, it's an untitled piece, and it's a wooden box that's about that tall. It's big enough for two people to crawl inside, and you, and I have binoculars in there. And the idea is that I can set it up in anybody's museum or anybody's gallery, and you could spy on the art. I thought it was a funny idea, because 
I noticed when I worked in art museums that um, people seemed like they might have things they wanted to say about art or they might have questions, but who are you going to ask because you're just in this big open room and it's kind of awkward. So I thought, wouldn't it be funny if I made a tiny little like duck blind kind of looking thing? It kind of looks like a duck blind or a confessional booth or a little of both. For those of you who have a background in, in Catholicism, it's got elements of kind of both. that has a little viewing window, but it also has this fancy curtain I sewed on the back that you go into. And I sit in there. That, so in the installation, I just sit inside there with my binoculars and wait for people to come in. And sometimes people don't know I'm in there, so I'll just go, psst, hey, psst, hey. Yeah, and you know exactly. Yeah, so it's and so we kind of. I'm like, what do you what do you really think about this artwork? So I get somebody to come in there. I'm like, what's your what's your favorite one? Does any of this you know is any of this artwork like not make any sense to you? And I mean, sometimes I think with contemporary art, we're afraid to say like, I don't get it. How many of you have ever looked at a contemporary artwork and and thought like, I don't understand what that's about? I'll even go the next step. I hear people say very often of the work of people like Jackson Pollock, like, I feel like he's playing a joke on me. Is this, is this actually artwork? Have you ever looked at an artwork and said, I think the artist is playing a joke on me? Yeah, so I kind of thought, like, so I've taken that idea, like, the idea that art could kind of be excluding you at your own expense, like you're the only one that's not in on it, the joke's on you. And I instead, like, I want to invite people in so that they can be part of the joke and that we can kind of say what we want to say about art and have conversations that might be more relevant to our lived experiences, but also to kind of have a little crack in the box, right? Mm -hmm. To peek out and to maybe think about other ways of knowing in a way that is safe and comfortable, that's not awkward and isn't about performing in a museum experience. So yeah, so I wish I could show you more stuff. And then my, my Instagram is more of a, it's a, it's a photo diary. So I don't use my Instagram as a lifestyle blog, and I don't only take pictures of cool stuff. In fact, I don't do a lot of cool stuff. I'm a pretty basic person, um, not to the extent that I live on Starbucks, but to the extent that I have no frills. I, I have three kids, and I, I spend a lot of time walking. Um, I spend a lot of time gardening. I spend a lot of time talking to people. And I spent a lot of time um, cooking. And so sort of, it's a random weird mix of all of those things. And it's just sort of a little, it's a, it's a little view of what my life is. I take pictures of my youngest child sleeping too. It's like I have a series of pictures of him taking naps. They're gonna hate you later. I know. I don't take, I don't take awkward pictures of him. But just while he's asleep. None that are particularly embarrassing. But I get what you're saying, yeah. And maybe later I'll delete them from my Instagram. That's a good point. Any other questions? Yeah, more questions? Cool. What do I think about Andy Warhol? Um, I like his book. <coughs> I, think, I think Andy Warhol, um, I think Andy Warhol kind of had his, he was sort of the first artists to kind of look at the seriousness and the and the sort of the, the the mythology of art and and to say that isn't really what society's about anymore. We're really kind of about consumer products. And he started out as a graphic designer. He was a really talented designer. Um, and then he kind of took his knowledge base and transferred it into the fine art world. And he did it in a way that was really clever. And he's one of the first artists to utilize openly a lot of assistance and a lot and kind of had this sort of empire. He even, he even kind of promoted the band The Velvet Underground. So I think he's an interesting guy because he works across a lot of disciplines and he really challenges that line of fine art. He's the first guy that makes us have to acknowledge something like institutional aesthetics. And institutional aesthetics says that no matter what you think about an artwork, it is officially art when and if it's in a museum. And because he could get that, those screen printed reproductions of Brillo boxes exhibited in a museum, he was able to make that case. So I think he moves the conversation about art forward. Whether or not I like his art, I like the way it looks. Like if you offered me an Andy Warhol artwork to hang in my house, yeah, I would totally hang in my house. I, but, I, but it's as much about the man, the myth, or the legend, and the fact that he challenges mythology that I like. I mean, I like that he totally like dressed in costume every day, too. I love the idea that like you create a persona 
and I think he's also one of the first sort of contemporary artists or modern artists that, well, is he's contemporary, right? Because he's pop. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah. he's one of the first contemporary artists that kind of has this whole, like, I'm a completely different person as an artist persona. And we have so many people since then who have picked up, like, costuming and wigs and makeup. And he's as much a performance artist as Lady Gaga. Anyway. She's taking her cues from him. I think so. Yeah, yeah I think that yeah. I think Lady Gaga has definitely like learned some things from Andy Warhol. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions, folks? Yeah. One more. What would be your suggestion for like young artists to like move forward in life and everything with their art and stuff? That's a great question. Yeah. Thanks. Um, kind of what I said, which is if you, I mean, whether or not it it has to do with where you want to live or where you want to do with your life. Get out in the world. It's scary. It's hard. The first time you move away from home, it's so overwhelming. It's like it it, it gets you right in the gut. Like it feels like feels like some part of you is being left behind. But after I made my first major move, it it was so life changing in the positive, and, and it gave me such a new insight into other ways of knowing the world. And it gave me an, an opportunity to step back. It's almost like you get to see yourself in third person because all these people are meeting you for the first time. Everybody you meet is a new person. And you start to 